a recent interviewee told me that you know, if you've seen one disaster, you've seen one disaster. Right. Contexts are completely different. Challenges are different. Yeah. You don't know what you're going to see until you get there. Right. What are the salient characteristics of this Nepal earthquake relief operation that make it unique? So in a lot of these disasters, we know that we're going to see similar needs. I think context changes uh, from place to place. So for example, in Haiti, in the 2010 earthquake there, much of the response was in a heavily populated urban environment like Port-au-Prince. Mm -hmm. In this case, the major damage and the most uh, difficult areas to reach are more in a rural place. Um, in Haiti, there was a pretty good road system, road networks you could access a lot of the places. In Nepal, a lot of the villages that you're trying to reach, there are no roads into them. Um, some of these villages uh, take you two, three, four days to walk to because there are just no roads. Um, you may find in one environment uh, that the road system, uh, there are numerous ways to access villages. So uh, if I can't come in from the north, I can come in from the northwest or I can come in from the northeast or there are three or four major roads coming into a certain area. In Nepal, what you're finding is there's one road in and one road out. And if that road has been cut off by a landslide or it's been uh, you know, washed away uh, or in some way damaged by the earthquake, all of a sudden you can't get in. Then if you're also looking at the difference between a sudden onset disaster and a conflict environment such as the Syrian conflict, uh, that begins to change everything because in a sudden onset environment, you're having people who want to stay as close to their home as possible. In Syria, you have people who are trying to flee from their home. And so, uh, again, um, they're both disasters, but you have to respond to them in different ways because the right. context is so right. different. So this transportation issue, I yes. think, is probably the one that's come to the fore right. most clearly. It's the one that we hear a lot about. Right. Um, how have you, how has World Vision Right. adapted its logistics to be able to deal with that challenge. Have you found any yeah. you know, particularly innovative or, or clever solutions to deal with the one way in, <laughs> one way out right. problem? So uh, there are a potential number of choke points at different, different places along the supply chain um, uh, continuum. Uh, if you're taking a look at getting out to the most affected areas, uh, in many cases we had to walk. Uh, and so in the Gorka area, which was where the epicenter of the earthquake, earthquake took place, we actually had uh, people who were walking for two days to get to some of these affected areas. Wow. Um, so that's one way of getting in. Interestingly enough, once you got in there, mobile phone networks were still running. So we could get in. We couldn't get vehicles there, but you could get in with a mobile phone and you could start uh, you know, calling out in terms right. of you know, what you're seeing. Sat phones, of course, our staff had sat phones, so there are different ways of communicating what we're seeing on the ground. Uh, and so that kind of starts the, you know, kind of, okay, we know what we need to do in this community. Now we have to think, how are we going to get it in? Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, are we using animals to get it in? Are we using porters to get them in? How are we going to walk supplies in? What kind of supplies are feasible to get into this area? Obviously, heavy items that would require vehicles to get in may not be workable here. Um, do we have access to relief flights, uh, helicopters, for example, in terms of doing drops? That type of stuff is coordinated with the government and with uh, logistics clusters that uh, are looking at where do we need to get stuff to urgently, you know, and so mm -hmm. prioritizing where the needs are. So yeah, we're very much engaged in wrestling with this logistics issue. If you were to take a look at our surge of people into the country, the biggest single group of people that we surged from outside the country were logs people. Hmm. Um, so it wasn't water, it wasn't sanitation, it wasn't health, it was logs because we know that that's, uh, if, you, if you can't get your logistics right, it doesn't matter what you want to do on the ground. Right. When you sort of look back before the earthquake and you think about the disaster risk reduction work that you had right. done before, did this play out the way that we expected it to? Hmm. And what was it like to watch something like this happen right. when you've thought so much about how it might happen? Right. 
So when it comes to doing risk reduction work, there are many types of initiatives that you can engage in. And I'm just going to kind of break them into soft initiatives and hard initiatives. Soft initiatives would be kind of the planning that you would do with a family or with a community when something happens. And so do they know where to go in terms of, uh, you know, kind of a meeting point? Do they know, you know, safe places? Do they know uh, or have they taken steps to, for example, make sure that they have some food that's in a secure place that they can access if they need mm -hmm. or water or whatever? And so it's kind of taking soft measures. It's kind of doing preparedness work uh, you know, with families and with communities and schools. Then you're looking at hard measures, which would include things like retrofitting. Mm -hmm. um, if you were concerned about flooding in an environment that uh, you've actually, you know, done whatever drainage, you know, adequate drainage to address possible flood needs in the area. So it's a combination of both, um, soft, you know, generally soft measures and, or generally hard measures. Mm -hmm. Most of our work is focused more on the soft measures. Mm -hmm. It's not been on the hard measures. The hard measures are really expensive. Right. Secondly, getting funding for hard measures is a huge challenge. And I'll just give you an example. Um, typically, uh, a grant that we'll get, let's say, from the U.S. government for working in an environment like uh, this, a post-disaster environment in terms of bringing relief, for a six-month period of time may run... 500000 to a million and a half dollars, something like that. So that's money that's readily available and we're accessing it from not only the U.S. government but from the Canadian government, the Australian, uh, a number of governments from around the world have stepped up and mm -hmm. we're accessing funding for providing immediate relief. When it comes to risk reduction, the types of grants that we're normally seeing are 150000 200000 400000 600000 well that gets chewed up very, very quickly if you were looking at doing um, hard right. risk reduction costs or, you know, or measures. So those kind of grants tend to go more towards soft uh, initiatives, mm -hmm. you know, where you're trying to prepare a community and doing efforts like that. Um, when it comes to kind of the infrastructure side of things, that, uh, you know, in some of these really poor countries, there just has not been enough money available for right. this. And so it's been, it's been, uh, a huge challenge and it's a risk and a hazard that we see and everyone sees. It's just can we actually find enough momentum uh, to do something about it.